So, um, hello and welcome to everybody um, for this special session of the Cliff Grads webinar series. Today's session is um, a special session which we're running in partnership with the World Farmers Organization. And so we're going to hear um, a panel discussion from three young farmers and ahead of that, an introduction on the World Farmers Organization itself. So I'm Deborah Knox and I am with the Global Research Alliance Secretariat. Um, for those of you who know Hazel, I work with her. Um, and so I'm gonna provide a few notes on today's session and how it's going to run. It's gonna be a little bit different from some of our previous sessions as we are gonna be running it more as a panel discussion. So a few notes, the session is being run as a webinar. So we're gonna have a short presentation first on the World Farmers Organization. And then we're going to hear three other short presentations from our young farmers. Feel free to um, ask questions throughout those presentations in the question and answer box so we can make sure that we have some good discussion ready to go for our, for our discussion session, which will follow after that. Um, make use of the chat function, as I already mentioned, to introduce yourself, say where you're joining from, but please make sure to use the question and answer box to ask questions of the panelists, just so we can keep track of only one system when we're looking for those questions. Um, if you haven't used the Zoom question and answer function before, you are able to type in those questions and then also like questions of other participants. And that'll ensure some of the most, the questions that most of the group wants to hear come to the top so we know which ones to pick. Um, and then the recording of the session will also be made available later on on the GRA website and we'll send out the link after this session. So let me introduce now the chair of today's session, Louisa Volpe, Head of Policy Development for the World Farmers Organization, which is a member organization composed of national farmer organizations and cooperatives whose international secretariat is based in Rome. Ms. Volpe is area of work is focused on global policy presentation and processes on climate change and the 2030 agenda food security and nutrition, research and innovation in agriculture, in, um, agriculture and food systems. Previously, Louisa had spent most of her professional career at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, EFAD, working on projects and policies targeting indigenous peoples and farmers. In 2012, Louisa joined the office of EFAD's president in, in the Partnership and Resource Mobilization Unit, working on public, public partnerships. Ms. Volpe also worked at the World Health Organization European office um, in Rome and in the private sector um, as a communication, in a communication agency specializing in events organization in Rome. She graduated in political science from La Spienza University in Rome in 2003. And in 2006, she obtained a master's of communication at Congo e Societe Management School of Rome. Um, she's an expert in neuro-linguistic programming at the master's level and, uh, and interpersonal communication. So welcome, Louisa. Thank you very much for agreeing to chair this session. Um, we're very pleased that this can sort of continue the partnership between the Global Research Alliance and the World Farmers Organization. And we're really looking forward to hearing about what you do in the World Farmers Organization and also your gymnasium program, which the young farmers that are speaking today have um, graduated from. Deborah, let me thank you very much, first of all, for uh, inviting the World Farmers Organization to be partner in this uh, event. Uh, for us, uh, young people and young farmers are probably the most important target. Uh, our members and boards value a lot the programs that we have with them, uh, but also the partnership with the GRA. We've been partnering with the GRA since long time, and uh, we've been also exchanging in uh, study tours in New Zealand and in Italy, and more has to come after COVID, possibly. So thank you also on behalf of uh, the whole organization for organizing this event and also for uh, having in the panel three of our uh, uh, strongest uh, members and uh, participants in uh, W4 programs. I will try to share my presentation uh, just to give you a heads up on um, what the W4 is about. Uh, 
and then please you can also interact me if you have questions uh, i will be i will go through the slides very briefly because i don't want to uh, spend so much time on technicalities but i'm ready to uh, an interactive discussion with you and uh, and the audience that is uh, uh, kindly following us today so, as you rightly said, the WFO is the World Farmers Organization, is an organization that was um, uh, funded by the farmers themselves through their national structure. This means that um, uh, all the people we represent are farmers, uh, only farmers, just farmers, uh, who have um, Mm, try to uh, establish a structure through which they are able to speak to the international uh, institutions and making advocacies on their uh, priorities and uh, interests at global level. Here you can see uh, um, uh, the distribution of our membership, which goes throughout the six continents. Uh, at the moment, we have 75 farmers organizations as members uh, from more than uh, 50 countries, which makes about 1.5 billion farmers represented through the WFO. So our vision is that one day, rural communities will be listened to in all the fora, uh, uh, that are represented at international level, that uh, have a decision-making uh, um, function at international level in a way that farmers are really sitting at the table of the most important um, policy-making structures that have an impact at global level, but also national and local level. So our mission is to represent the farmers in these tables, making sure that the farmer's voice is heard. The, in uh, 2017, we approved uh, a new strategic framework, which is uh, um, meant to uh, implement the vision and the mission of W4 in its structure in five pillars. The representation, so representing the farmer's voice, the networking, open it up to uh, partnerships, the policy development, because as always, as a, Tio, our president, always says you cannot influence policies if you don't have policies. So our main function is also to um, structure policies that can really represent the farmer's voice and advocate for it. Advocacy is, in fact, the fourth pillar of our strategic framework. And indeed, we also have a special attention to uh, the capacity building of our members and the gymnasium program that uh, I will uh, describe later on in my presentation is part of this pillar. The, the best part of this organization is that uh, we implement a bottom-up approach. What does this mean? That it's in our farmers to elaborate policies and positions vis-a-vis -vis special events or global discussions. How do we do it? We do it through working groups. We have, in fact, eight working groups on teams that are uh, priorities for the W4 and that touch base on the main teams that have more influence in the agricultural sector and in our farmers. You, you can see I'm not going through all of that, but of course, youth empowerment and climate change are among these. The governance of W4 is structured, uh, is kind of simple, but also made in a way that all the membership is represented. The General Assembly, which is basically the representation of all members of the organization, is the uh, entity that has more power uh, within the organization. The General Assembly then delegates the uh, management of the organization to the board of directors. The board is composed of one member 
um, per each constituency, meaning um, one member per regional, uh, um, for, uh, per continent, sorry. So you have Africa, Europe, Latin America, North America, and Oceania and Asia. And the General Assembly also elects the president. The president is at the moment uh, uh, Dr. Theo de Jager, um, farmer from South Africa. And this is the secretariat. We are very few, as you can see, but uh, uh, very young and dynamic. Uh, the Secretary General is at the moment Arianna Giulio Dori. And uh, here you can see the picture of all the members in the Secretariat. Uh, we are few, but um, uh, very committed to serve our uh, uh, farmers' members. Our partners. Uh, are composed of, of course, farmers, civil society, private sector organization, and all kinds of stakeholders that uh, uh, work in the agricultural sector. Because one of the beliefs of the organization is that farmers cannot do anything alone, but they need to partner with other members in the value chain and other actors that can have an influence at political level. And of course, one of um, our main partners, as I said, is the GRA, which was actually also one of the first partnership that the organization established uh, in uh, uh, 2012, uh, the, the year when it was created. As I said, climate change is a priority for us. Uh, and for this, uh, we um, have uh, also um, established another program that is called the Climakers. The Climakers is an alliance of members that see farmers' organization first and then other members that uh, represent the other stakeholders. But the, 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 the theme I would like to concentrate today is uh, our programs on young farmers. Uh, as I said, youth empowerment is uh, probably the first priority of the organization. And our uh, uh, young farmers are entirely, entirely involved in all the uh, activities of the organization. We also have a youth committee that is composed of uh, uh, two members uh, from each of the constituencies of WFO and a facilitator. And actually the youth uh, committee is the committee that uh, um, promotes and leads the position of our young farmers mainstreaming their ideas within the organization. What is the gymnasium program that I touched based on before? The gymnasium program is a high level capacity building program that uh, we have established in collaboration with the uh, buyer. And it's actually a program where our young farmers um, uh, receive uh, classes, lessons, on uh, teams related to agriculture uh, from international experts that are um, people working in our uh, partners, partner organizations, international organizations, experts of the sector, I would say. And uh, um, the program lasts for a couple of years in which our group of young farmers uh, meet couple of times per year, back-to-back -back international events and conferences, so that they are exposed to the class uh, lessons for uh, two days. And for the following two days, they also attend um, the international conference so that they have a practical experience on what they have learned in the class. I leave it to Sarah, Richard and Brenda to describe their experience in the first edition of the gymnasium. Uh, but I can advance that a second edition is going to start in uh, uh, November. 2020, next month, with a new group of people. So I'm really hoping that uh, we can continue this collaboration uh, and this uh, program for the years to come. This is the uh, first group 
of the gymnasium. Here we were uh, in uh, New York in a break during our classes. And uh, uh, I think that uh, we have all enjoyed the experience from the smiles that you can see from the faces of our students. Some numbers. So the first group was composed of uh, uh, 18 people. The next one would be more or less 20, maybe more. So uh, at the moment we are uh, empowering like uh, 40 young farmers. The month of training is more or less 30. The first group had six sessions within the 30 months. And uh, they received 25 training modules from international experts, which by the way included also representatives of GRA. And they also had an opportunity to uh, participate in international conferences and events, like as you can see, the CFS, Committee on World Food Security in Rome, the GFFA in Berlin, the UNHLPF meetings in New York, Madrid, the UNFCCC COP25, and then the last session was held in Rome in W4 offices, uh, where they could also have one full day dedicated to the construction of personal skills uh, beyond the technical skills with a team of uh, coaching. If you want to follow W4 and W4 activities, these are all our social networks. Uh, for the moment, I will uh, stop here, but I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Louisa. Um, really good presentation. Please, can I just um, remind everybody to start putting your questions into the Q&A box. If you have any questions for Louisa at this time for the WFO. Otherwise, um, I might just ask you, Louisa, to introduce the first of our panelists so we can get started on that. And we'll come back to the questions that everybody's asking at the end. Sure, Deborah, thank you. Um, I would like to start with Sara. Sara is um, uh, a young farmer. Uh, from New Zealand. She's been very active uh, both in the gymnasium program of the first edition but also in uh, uh, supporting us with the cooperation with the GRA. Um, we have also actually uh, leveraged on her experience in uh, constructing a very nice study tour in the New Zealand farms, including hers. And she also participated in, a, the, in the study tour in Italy. So Sara, please give us some heads up of your experience in collaborating in these two programs. Thanks. Oh, I will just gonna share my screen and just talk a little bit about my farm and things first. Um, um, Oh, so um, basically, yeah, so from, from New Zealand, um, as Louise has pointed out, just a little bit of background about um, my farm. So I'm farming with my um, parents and an awesome team of staff on the east coast of New Zealand's North Island. Um, so we're farming 3,770 hectares, which is even by New Zealand standards, reasonably big, um, less than 10% 10, 10 of that cultivatable so it is um, sort of true true hill country pasture-based farming um, we've got about 300 hectares of forestry running roughly 20,000 sheep and a thousand cattle um, family actually started farming originally in uh, New York in the States and moved to New Zealand in 1998 so um, have had experience farming across um, both continents, which gives gives an interesting perspective to a lot of discussions, and we've got family farming in the states still. Um, on the farm, we've done quite a few trials over the years, um, so have had quite a lot of engagement with the research com community and scientists and stuff. We've done um, nitrogen trials, trials around clover management, um, trials around lifetime sheep performance, um, amongst other things. Um, 
just in terms of some of the con New Zealand context, just a couple things to point out. Uh, so I thought I'd just touch on briefly in case they come up in Q and A discussion. Just trying to provide a bit of context to sort of where I'm where I'm coming from from that New Zealand perspective. Um, sort of some of the interesting things that are going on in New Zealand is we've got, and you might have heard about some of these earlier in previous sessions um, uh, through the through the GRA. Um, so we've got the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium, um, which is focused on providing knowledge and tools to um, New Zealand farmers for, for mitigation um, in the agriculture se sector. And that's, um, that's a partnership between the sectors that got um, set up about a decade ago, um, basically so that they can invest, invest in tools to, to help us with that mitigation. And they work quite closely with the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre, which I'm sure you guys have all um, come across, which has very similar focus, uh, uh, very similar focus. Um, with yeah, focusing on um, agricultural mitigations. Uh, other one, um, a new newish program in the last year is um, Hey Waka Ikanawa, um, which has got thirteen partners um, across the primary industry and um, government, and that's all focused on primary sector emissions and digging down to that to that farm farm level um, because a lot of stuff. To this point has been done uh, done nationally um, and so that's sort of focused on on farm reporting looking at um, finding an appropriate uh, pricing mechanism um, looking at farm plans and um, on farm measurement and management management techniques um, so that's um, it's in its early days but it's uh, probably quite a unique internationally piece of work um, to try and to try and think bring things down to the farm to the farm level. Um, yeah, which will which will be which is from a farmer's perspective a very interesting experience, but also a very complicated one um, and one very reliant on being informed by quality science, which is where where you guys um, all come in. Um, and then two pieces of legislation that sort of dominate the discussion about climate change in New Zealand are um, the Zero Carbon Bill, um, which includes New Zealand's um, commitment to be net zero by 2050. Um, but what's probably a little bit unique about that commitment is we've taken a split gases approach because um, there was a recognition that GWP 100 doesn't work very well for methane, um, which is the lion's share of New Zealand's agricultural emissions. And um, so they've got, we've got a separate target for methane. Um, which is part of what was driving, uh, which is driving some of the work in Haywalker Ekanoa. Um, and then we've also got a, an emissions trading scheme, um, which has, doesn't include livestock emissions at this stage, um, part, partly because of the difficulties in um, farm, level, farm level accounting. Um, and also just touching on um, the uh, gymnasium and GRA study tour, awesome absolutely incredible programs to be involved in. Um, uh, great to share ideas um, and be able to network with like-minded individuals from around the world um, and be able to share that, share that knowledge and ideas and um, sort of really broaden uh, your perspective and empathy and understanding about the challenges other countries are facing and how they're how they're responding and what what's going on because so many of our so many of our challenges are common globally um and i you see that a lot particularly in uh, you know the climate change space for example um that you know if we find mitigations um that work in one country they're likely to work in other countries so that collaboration becomes so important and so that op opportunity to to be able to collaborate internationally and have those relationships um, enduring into the future is just so invaluable. So um, very grateful for um, for those programs. Um, and yeah, obviously happy to have Q and A throughout the um, rest of the session. But just yeah, trying to provide a bit of context uh, to to from from the New Zealand perspective and sort of where I'm coming from. So if I if I say strange things, you sort of have a bit of an idea about why. <laughs> 
Sara, thank you very much for sharing your experience. That was great. So before I move to uh, Richard, um, I see some, uh, some uh, questions in the chat box and all of them relate to how do I be part of the gymnasium program? <laughs> You are all very welcome as young farmers, but let me clarify that uh, the program is um, uh, reserved to the membership of W4. So the first step would be to um, promote your organization participation in uh, W4 as a member, and then uh, for the next edition of the gymnasium, you can of course apply and uh, your uh, candidacy will be considered to be part of this uh, program. There are some uh, requirements. The first of all, of course, is the membership to W4. Um, you have to be a young farmer, so less than 35 years old, um, English speaker, and uh, nothing more. So hope this clarifies, but then please uh, don't hesitate to contact the secretariat directly. Thank you. I also see that uh, Rangari Rai, sorry for my pronunciation, Lucia Mindu has uh, uh, raised the hand. Please, Lucia, the floor is yours. Hello? Lucia, I think you are muted. I'm sorry, I didn't notice I raised my hand. That was a mistake. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. So uh, let me uh, call upon our second speaker going from New Zealand to Europe. Uh, Richard, can you tell us can you share your experience in your country as a young farmer and also as a participant in the gymnasium program? Thanks. Thank you very much, Lucia. And good morning, everybody. And it's, it's quite difficult to follow two fantastic presentations there. And, and that's how I want to introduce myself, really. I, I'm here as, as the practical, um, hands-on commercial farmer. So I'm, I'm not gonna be that sciencey. I'm, I'm gonna talk quite layman terms. Um, but again, we're running a business at the end of the day and I feel very honoured to be part of this discussion as well because I think we're all stronger when we all work together and we all put our ideas together. So just to give you a bit of background information, we, we farm uh, right in the middle of the UK. Um, so just about 20 miles north of Birmingham, which is called the West Midlands and, and, and the county is called Staffordshire. And, and we're beef and cereal farmers. Um, we do a lot of environmental work as well. And then we welcome a lot of visitors on, onto our farm as well, which we think is very, very important. But how it all started for our family business um, was through my grandparents, actually, about 70 years ago. Um, my grandmother was one of six children and my grandfather was one of seven children. They were both farming families, but because they were such big families, they were told to go off and, and make their own way in life. And that's what they did. They, they rented a farm and they worked very, very hard and they managed to buy that farm. And then they also managed to buy a second farm as well. So both their sons managed to have a farm each. And, and again, that it was all down to very much hard work, no days off, and, and just being totally dedicated to what they do. And when we talk about sustainability nowadays, I think there's probably no people that are more sustainable than my grandparents, to be honest. That they didn't waste anything. They, they ate all their food locally and, and they shopped locally and everything. And I think now we've almost lost that a bit, it's especially in the UK with, with the way the, the developed economy is. So personally, I grew up with, with that background and, and I always knew I was going to be a farmer. I grew up, I grew up on the family farm and, and really loved what farming was all about. But my family actually said to me, Richard, there's no money in farming. Go, go and work for Tesco or one of the big supermarkets. That's where all the money is. Uh, so I went and did a, a degree in food marketing with, with business studies. And, and what was quite interesting when I went to, to do my degree, um, that the talk was there was, oh, we, we'll always need farmers because uh, the, the global population is, is growing so big, so we need to produce more and more food. 
Now, I think we all know in this discussion today, it, it isn't quite that simple because how we how we produce that food and the impacts that we have on on, on the climate is, is very, very important. And also the impacts that climate has on how we can produce our food as well and food security. And, and that's something I'd like to touch on in, in a second. But just to carry on my, my personal story. So I've realized through my career that um, we, we're affected very much by, by politics and, and also affected it's all about turning up and being part of the conversation and I always say if, if you're not at the at the dinner table you're on the dinner so so it's best to be at the dinner table and be part of the discussion so so that's why I do a lot of work with the National Farmers Union in in, in the UK and um, so I've been a, a local chairman I, I've been a county chairman and I've also chaired something called the Next Generation Policy Forum which is all about young farmers being involved in policy decisions that shape our future and I think the NFU is a very very important organisation and, and that's the links that I've got through to the WFI, uh, WFO and, and being on the gymnasium, which, which again was a fantastic experience. But, but if, when I look at the few challenges that we have in the UK, and, and I, I think unfortunately one of the biggest elephants in the room that I think we, we all challenge is as the climate is changing, um, food security is going to get more and more difficult. So the, the challenge is then that probably farmers are going to probably try and cultivate more land to, 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 to beat that food security issue. But then the more land that we cultivate or the more intensively that we cultivate things, we might even cause more issues on, on, on the climate and climate change as well. So, so I think we have, have massive challenges there of, of how we can uh, put, put a square peg in, in a round hole, for example. And, and even in, in, in the UK, the extremes that we're facing at the moment, we've just had our worst harvest for what we think is about 40 years. So, so, so the grain harvest in the UK was below 10 million tonnes. Um, last last year it was 16 million tons and yeah we, we haven't had it below 10 million tons for 40 years so so, so that's a challenge and, and again it's how you incentivize farmers or how policy and policy and farmers work together to ensure that we don't cause damage to to, to the to the climate and, and essentially in the uk we're, we're very highly regulated as well so we're very regulated of some of the questions is how, how do we work with science well we, we are very high, highly regulated on, on what we what, what we can use what inputs we can use um, but, and then we do work with the academics and we work with the, the universities as well. Um, like personally on my farm, like so I'm very commercial, so I try to use as many manures on the farm as possible and, and digestate as well from anaerobic digesters, which is organic fertilizers rather than using man-made fertilizers. And first and foremost, that's because hopefully there's a bit of a cost saving there for our business, but also we think it, it, it's good. It's good for the environment. Um, but, but being one of the farmers that do, does that, I have worked with the James Hutton Institute, which is based up in Scotland, and they've come and done soil tests on the farm just to check if there's any differences between using, using those, different, those, 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 those different types of fertilisers. Um, being part of the WFO gymnasium, I feel, gave me an insight into what is going on in the future. And it, compared to the discussions that are going on at home, on the gymnasium we're having discussions that are 10 years in advance and even just listening to Sarah's discussion there as well it's fantastic how, how yeah, the, the GAR or GI are, are very focused on on, on greenhouse emissions and, and, and how we can combat this and how we can adapt and mitigate to it in the UK we have been a little bit behind this um, it's actually three years that this week since we started the gymnasium and, and then what's happened in the UK we've actually set ourselves an ambitious target of trying to be net zero by 2040 but we only actually set that last year even though on the gymnasium we were talking about this three years ago so like i said that, that, that's the, that's the advantage that the gymnasium has given me an, an insight into the future and, and working working with everybody but in terms of the net zero target that we're setting ourselves and it's my generation that's going to be focused on this and even the generation behind us that's going to have to achieve this um, we're looking at essentially resource efficiencies so trying to get as much out of, of what we are being using on the farm being as productive as possible and um, we're looking at re renewable energy production on, on, on farms as well and that's to displace fossil fuels and then we're also looking at carbon sto storage on farm and that's through trying to store carbon in our soils through increasing organic level organic matter levels um, but also in the vegetation in the trees that we grow in, in the hedgerows as well so, so again i'm not going to pretend to know all the science behind it but, but that is the focus and that's probably my my, my future career, uh, the, the, the direction it's going to go in. I'm happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you also for uh, pointing out that uh, if farmers are not at the table, they are probably in the menu. 
which is exactly why our organizations exist. Because farmers have to sit at the table and discuss fairly and openly with governments, with international institutions, and with all those decision-making entities that decide on policies that then have an impact in the country up to the farm level. And I hope that this also replies to one of the questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, Titis Abdini, sorry for my pronunciation, but um, you know, as an Italian, I'm, sometimes it's very difficult for me to read the uh, names. Uh, and you ask, how does the policy advocacy by the before work? It's about global or national. Can you give examples? Yes, it's global, definitely global. We, we talk to United Nations organizations, uh, World Bank, WTO, those organizations that, um, as I was saying before, have uh, uh, decision-making power in a concerted way with governments that then have to implement uh, those agreements, those decisions at country level. One big example is, for example, the negotiations on climate and the Paris Agreement itself. It was also thanks to the advocacy work of WFO that some mentions to food production and food security have been included in the agreement. Because when Richard says UK has decided last year to go net zero in 2040, and now we have to look for solutions to achieve this target. This is exactly what comes from an international agreement, which is the Paris Agreement, and how this then has an impact in national policies that farmers, together with other actors, are called to implement. So that, that's why it is important that farmers discuss and negotiate at international level. I have a nice question in the, in the chat box that is from Durba Kashap. What is the major climate change related challenge that the farmers are facing and how are they dealing with it? I will ask, uh, after the panel, I will ask our uh, uh, young farmers to reply to these questions. And the other question is on, uh, from Tulazi, work on mitigation of uh, GHGs in partnership with the farmers in Nepal is quite challenging with the viewpoint of the cost associated with. Can someone provide some highlights how the resources are managed, especially cost of studies in personal farms? And um, this is something that probably Sarah from New Zealand can uh, uh, reply. But uh, I would like to go uh, back to our uh, Young Farmers presentations and call on uh, Brenda uh, to give, to share her uh, insights from South Africa. Brenda is also um, managing a farm in, the, in South Africa, which is also the country of our president. So today she has uh, three legacies to bring on the table. The first one is hers as young farmer, woman young farmer. The second one is also a, um, a responsibility that uh, received uh, a sad burden yesterday because uh, um, the president of her organization, AFASA, uh, passed. So I would like to thank Brenda in particular for uh, having joined this panel despite the sad moods. Uh, bringing the uh, legacy and the responsibility of the organization on her shoulders. And also, uh, as representative of the gymnasium program and all the activities in W4. So Brenda, thank you very much. First of all, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah. Please excuse me if my voice becomes a bit shaky. 
Um, I'm a farmer in South Africa, uh, first generational farmer. I'm doing mixed farming in my family. Um, and mainly there's crops, uh, which is grains and fresh produce, livestock. I do cattle, I do goats and game. And in the last two years, I've already, I've started to move to other value chains like uh, packaging and processing of nutritious and uh, fortified food. And I guess what brought um, the need for, for us to start now processing was to realize just how unaffordable food is, uh, especially in my continent uh, in Africa. So the company was set up just to make sure that uh, one is able to ensure that no one goes to bed hungry and also to reduce the cost of uh, obtaining food for those uh, people who are um, not able to afford nutritious food. So um, my involvement in the sector has been uh, around, I guess it's more around the passion as well for people in terms of, um, I grew up with a mom who was, who left teaching uh, and just to go to food processing. And that has opened up my mind in terms of, uh, to re in terms of realizing the pains that it takes for a lot of people to put food on their table. And it was one of the main drivers for me to enter into the agricultural sector as well. And also, I battled as well um, with uh, getting access to resources as a young person who wanted to start uh, begin to participate in the sector. Uh, one was on the financial side, it was um, inclusivity as well as a young woman as well, which uh, in Africa, farming is known to be more of a man's kind of uh, industry and just coming out as this young person who you first crossing on the gender border lines and also not only that and also the racial lines as well so it has been one of the reasons which made me aware or made me want to do more in terms of ensuring that i become part of um, uh, the few that are targeting to transform the sector and I'm with the organization, uh, AFASA, which is a national organization. I'm also on the executive council, national executive council. And currently I'm serving as one of the ministerial trustees in the Meat Industry Trust, which are part of government, which safeguard um, the minister's interest in terms of the, how the trust are run and also how we manage uh, the resource. Like for this one, it's more mainly targeted on the meat industry and also the research component of what uh, best ways do we have there in terms of uh, one, um, raising our livestock and also just finding any other solutions with talk to your greenhouse gas emissions. Cause we know everyone will always complain about uh, how cattle uh, just uh, main polluters in terms of releasing methane and also depleting uh, or contributing rather to your soil erosions. And also coming from the technology industry, which is where I started my career or when I started, um, I started uh, my career in the ICT industry. And my dream has always been to find ways where we transform and find new ways of modernizing our way of funding. And I guess my involvement in the gymnasium as well, uh, it just opened up my eyes. And in terms of the different modules that we engaged on, embarked on, including the top um, global lecturers and researchers that we were able to engage with, that were able to impart that valuable knowledge to us. It made me realize that the, importance, the importance between integration of the science fraternity, which is mainly on the research component and the technology and also the inclusion of the indigenous way of um, farming as well. And at the heart of everything, 
for me, it's about good agricultural practices. And I think that's one of the main drivers where uh, the World Farmers Organization saw the need to start now um, with a program or to champion, to set up and champion the Climate Makers program, and which is a voice of farmers which puts back um, the power in the farmer's hand where we all now are able to produce um, scientific based facts as to why we feel we are the solution to preserving nature other than what in the other industry are painting us in a bad light that we are the main polluters and also just to be equipped as well uh, with the policy issue where we have been taught to spearhead the advocacy on the trades on the policy and trade side and also to to also be the voices of young farmers globally and in the for, for me, the core was more around um, the preservation of our natural resources and farming in a sustainable manner. And back to the COVID issue or how it disrupted our lives, I guess it, in many aspects for me, uh, it brought uh, some positives as well as challenges where it now uh, forced us globally to start thinking about how best can we utilize our resources, our skills to narrow down the geographical disconnect. I mean, we have seen like in the first uh, lockdown when most of the countries were under severe lockdown regulations, uh, the farming industry was the only sector which could uh, which was really allowed to operate in most countries. And also it was a question also to make sure that with all the restrictive movement that were imposed, we still managed to consolidate or rather to coordinate the logistics system thereof. And for that mainly we relied on technology. And that's another issue which um, even most farmers previously were a bit apprehensive about including or inclusion of technology into their farming practices. It's no longer now um, a nice thing to have. They realized that it became part of, uh, it became one an equalizer and number two an enabling uh, tool for us to connect and to conduct our businesses. Also <clears throat> the so on some of the programs that we exposed to on the gymnasium were around the management of resources, which I touched briefly on. Uh, one was the fertilizer and pesticide management, where one need to always be cognizant of usage of contamination of the soil and when you also now get to the second line where you know if you have, if you take something out of the soil, you need to give back part of it. Like uh, you need to put the nutrients back onto the soil. And so that we avoid the data mining and the soil erosion components. And also excessive usage of your antibiotics and the effect of uh, that on the human life as well. And in our part of the continent, we never used to have um, constant um, uh, flood or it was not, we never used to have, it was quite unheard of where we did not really know what floods were in most part of the continents. I mean, it's things that we see on the media, but experiencing that on our own firsthand, it's something that has sort of, um, shocked us in the last few years. Uh, we've seen a prevalence thereof and how excessive and how constant they have become over a period of time. We have now sort of starting to normalize this erratic weather patterns and conditions. And also we have 
started to see the excessive heat uh, conditions that we have. We start now to see a lot of drought in many parts of our continents also. And that only tells us that a lot has changed in terms of how we as human beings uh, communicate or, or do our activities or run our activities rather uh, with the universe that there has been some disconnect. So bringing programs that bring harmony into uh, the universe, usage of the natural resources and also ensuring that uh, we have food access, food uh, security, and also um, avoid um, post-harvest losses which affect farmers. And I guess for me, that has been some of the best tools that um, the gymnasium has afforded me um, just to also understand how or who to call should one run into um, a difficulty of some sort through my farming, pro, pro, uh, farming uh, pro, program, so entity. And also just to know that we have pool of resources uh, globally as to where one can always um, check upon and maybe bounce ideas of in terms of when one needs to either um, improve on the farm management in general, and just to get ideas in terms of how other farmers are doing in other parts of the world. So yeah, that's more or less uh, for me. And in most instances, yeah, those are some of the questions that, um, there are some questions that one would need um, the science fraternity to also uh, back us up or assist us with as a farming community. Um, in terms of bridging that divide that has always been there, which is, which to some extent has more or less been sort of too cold. And I'm sure that uh, through pro proper consultation and proper collaboration, we can both find ourselves and also realize that uh, it's in our interest to coexist and to work together as the two communities which were previously separated. Thank you. Brenda, thank you very much. You touched upon many, many uh, items that are actually on the table and the pipeline of the World Farmers Organization. And I would like to thank you because underlining the fact that farmers are uh, uh, putting their own strengths and efforts to become resilient to shocks like COVID-19, uh, but also investing for mitigating the climate change, especially in the livestock sector, and working for the health of soils, which is actually the basis for all kinds of agriculture. Everything starts from soils. You can be forest farmer, livestock farmer, crop farmer, uh, all kind of uh, agricultural uh, specificity has to, uh, as, uh, has to have the assumption that soils are healthy. And that is means also uh, an effective uh, use of uh, input, seeds, fertilizers, and um, in this sense, it is true that uh, uh, we have to close the gap between science and uh, farmers. Uh, sometimes uh, scientists complain because farmers don't apply uh, solutions that are so obvious to them, while farmers complain that science is providing answers to questions that they have never made. So actually at the basis of the partnership between W4 and GRA, there is also a common view of closing this gap. And I'm happy to uh, share with the audience and with you all that uh, in this direction, W4 has established uh, a scientific council, which is composed of uh, international scientists uh, that have committed to uh, speak the scientific language, but with the voice of the farmers, which means 
translating the farmers' messages into the science language to be able to speak to the other entities, academia, university, research centers uh, in the agricultural sector. So this is another achievement uh, that W4 um, made this year, and uh, I'm happy to share it with you as well. Let me go to the uh, chat box and see uh, what are some questions that we have received. Um, I would like to ask uh, my three uh, young farmers, what is the major climate change challenge um, that you are experiencing at farm level and how are you dealing with it? It's nice because we have a representation uh, from uh, Europe, from South Africa and from New Zealand. So probably answers to different questions, um, sorry, different answers, answers to the same questions may apply. And this is also good because uh, from uh, uh, an exchange, uh, probably we can also uh, increase the knowledge of each other. Let me start with Sarah and then to Richard and then Brenda to reply to these questions. What are you doing practically in your farms to address climate change related challenges? Sarah, yeah, so the, the floor is like, yours. The biggest thing we're seeing um, so far is the, the increased frequency and ex extre the like more extreme um, sort of adverse weather events. So be it floods and storms or drought. So we're getting more droughts that last for longer um, and more storms that are doing, you know, we're getting hundred year storms and floods every three years. Um, and so they're, they're kind of the two biggest ones. The one, not a heap we're able to do about the storms. We're doing a lot of erosion planting and um, things like that to try and um, help, help manage, manage some of the effects. But um, the drought one's the biggie, especially because we're, we're in a summer dry region anyway. So we always struggle to grow, grow grass um, through that summer period. So really what we're doing is um, We've adjusted our stock policy and farm system to include more flexibility to try and help make us more resilient so that as if, if we do get dry, we've got more levers in our farm system we can pull. We've got um, more trading stock so we can reduce our stock numbers. Um, we're using a lot of different types of forages um, and more drought resistant, uh, you know, drought resilient, uh, deep rooted clovers and lucerne. Um, so our plants that will perform in those um, more extreme prolonged dry periods uh, to help get us through. Um, and then obviously doing our part as farmers to, um, you know, focus on reducing our emissions. Um, and uh, so both in terms of how we can um, reduce emissions from our livestock, uh, farm them more efficiently, have them around for less time so they're we're still getting the same amount of product from, uh, from for less emissions. And so we're, yeah, there's a constant drive to re reduce our emissions intensity. Um, and then also lots of, you know, tree planting for a variety of reasons, but including um, uh, carbon offsets because, um, and using them as a carbon sink. So that's some of, some of what's going on, going on here. Thank you, Sara. I think you can be proud <laughs> of what you're doing there. <laughs> Richard, would you like to share your experience in mitigating and adapting to the climate change? Yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, it's difficult to follow Sarah because I'd love to just echo everything that she said. It's so, so true that the extreme weather events that, that, that we're facing, um, like I've just like I said before, we've had the worst harvest in 40 years. But well, that all amalgamated in the wettest autumn on record, so we couldn't plant any crops, um, and, and we kept trying to plant crops, and, and we kept trying to plant crops in right into January and February. But then we actually had Storm Dennis and Storm Kira that came through and just flooded us out again. 
Um, we then got into March and from March to May, it went very, very dry, drier than what we're used to actually. So we started planting crops again to get them, to get them, well, to, to give us something to harvest in the summer, but then it was almost too dry that those crops didn't actually come to anything. And, and the ones which we had managed to plant in, in the autumn, um, again, they didn't really come to anything either. And then all summer, we've had a very wet summer in the UK. And so again, it's just these extremes, it's from one to the other, and, and actually we're in a very wet time again now when we're trying to plant last year's crops and sometimes you think you don't have the same year two years on the trot but we, we seem to be having that a lot more frequently at the moment um so what are we doing really which we're changing some of the crops that we're planting so we're obviously not putting our, all our eggs into one basket um honestly on our farm we're actually growing some energy crops as well as growing food crops as well because that, that's what the market wants and it just gives us a bit more diversity in, in, in what we're growing um very much the same as Sarah, we've actually reduced our livestock numbers, but we've specialised more. So we've, we've focused more on tradi traditional British breeds. So the Aberdeen Angus, uh, which was bred in the UK as a beef animal, it grows much better in this climate. It grows off a grass fed system. So, so we're focused on more quality, um, quality uh, meat rather, rather than just going for the commodity, commodity market. Um, and then we've also planted trees on our farm as well. And, and again, from a visual point of view, from a, an erosion point of view, from, from a carbon capture point of view. Um, so, so yeah, there's lots of little things, but again, it does worry me the, the, the frequency of, of these extreme weather events and, and how we're going to combat it going forward. Thanks very much, Richard. You are uh, also uh, putting so much effort at farm level. And um, this year that uh, uh, COP26 will be held in Glasgow. I, I really hope that you will also have an opportunity to participate in the construction of the conference, also showing what the farmers are uh, really doing already to implement the climate change agreement. Thank you. Brenda, please share your experience on practical practices that you are implementing on your farms? Um, for me, it, uh, I just tweaked a little bit. Um, my cattle have always been on natural, um, I've all, all, always um, grazed on natural pastures. So I'm not uh, using uh, or I'm not putting them on the feedlot. So that number one allows them to adapt to or to get to know the to, or to be inclined rather to the natural way of uh, rearing and on the crop side um, it's usage of organic matter over the fertilizer which has also helped to make sure that um, the organic uh, practices are adhered to and that talks to the agenda of the farmers that we always uh, encourage uh, in terms of uh, agroecology. So that's like being or harmonizing our farming practices. And also um, going back to, uh, to going back to using our indigenous um, uh, crops, like uh, over the years we have seen a lot of farmers moving away from your sorghums and your legumes, which are in turn very, very nutritious in terms of giving back the nitrogen and other valuable nutrients back to the soil. So um, in the last few years, we in the last few years now, we are gradually going back that after we realize that um, changing too much or introducing a lot of uh, genetically modified uh, seed as some bit of disruption on our natural resources, on how our soil gets uh, changed, or how our soils change, and also making sure that uh, one avoids the the soil uh, erosion component. Where I've always planted a natural pasture, so that also helps in terms of preserving my soils as well for, for my cattle. So those are just major, minor uh, contributions as well. On the fresh produce side, it's uh, using technologies that are using less water like your drip system in, te in uh, light of or versus 
the pivot system, which only makes sure that you water only on where needed, where water is needed. So that also helps to manage my, so my one, my water uh, to reduce the cost as well and to make sure that one preserves this most valuable resource in terms of funding. Uh, that's what I'm doing on my part. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brenda. This was also very useful. Mm, I was looking at the chat box and uh, many of the questions are actually aligned on the same message. That farmers, especially livestock farmers, are under the spotlight because it seems that um, agriculture is seen as a big um, uh, responsible for the climate change, especially due to um, greenhouse gas emission um, of the sector. Actually, we all know here, because we are experts, but uh, uh, I'm inviting you to a kind of reflection. Um, we know that uh, agriculture has also a huge potential in uh, carbon sequestration. We also know uh, from the late experience during the lockdowns that uh, uh, when all the other sectors are, uh, uh, are um, not working uh, while agriculture is, which is the experience that we had in the last months, then the planet seems to be relieved in a way. So as uh, actors in the farming sector, we can accept that uh, agriculture has its part of responsibility in uh, uh, affecting the planet and the resources but can also be a huge solution to the climate change. What it's really much more difficult to accept is this new trend of promoting uh, uh, plant-based food as a solution to the climate change because uh, meat is that part of the sector that pollutes the most because apparently the livestock sector is the one that is creating more soil erosion, et cetera. So my question to you, to the three of you, is uh, uh, what message would you give to the decision-making people to tell them that uh, plant-based only diets are actually not the solutions that are not viable, that are not sustainable, and that the livestock sector and the agricultural sector more broadly are actually contributing to really mitigate the climate change. So I would like to invite the three of you to make some reflections on this and tell me uh, what would you if you could sit in the next climate change negotiations at ministerial level, what would you tell the world's ministers to convince them of our message as farmers to the world? Let me start this time with Richard because he complains that he always comes after Sarah. So, Richard, some <laughs> this time you can start and then it will be Brenda and then Sarah in the end. Thank you very much, Lucia. Um, the, 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 the challenge we have is we will never tell people what they should or shouldn't eat as well. So it's all, it's all about choice and it's always all, and, and, and providing as much choice as possible. And, and that's our job as farmers. But, but, but it's about the balance and it's about understanding the whole complex and the of the whole chain as well so i mean i'm going to pinch sarah's picture you saw where sarah farms on on, on that fantastic landscape well you couldn't grow the plants on that landscape to, to feed the world 
but but you can grow grass on that landscape and that grass will grow naturally and, and it'll produce beef which which then humans can eat and, and digest as, as a very rich source of protein and a very healthy source of protein as, as well so, so i think we have to be aware of, of how we how we grow these crops as well for example on our farm we grow potatoes on our farm well, the potatoes always grow better when, when we put some manure from the, the animals onto the land before we grow the potatoes. So, so, so that person who might just be choosing a plant-based diet might be eating a plant-based diet, but without that manure underneath those potatoes, and, and that really, help, really helps in, in times of drought as well. So, so it is su such a balance. Um, I mean, another example is on our farm, we grow strawberries as well. But, but the amount of plastic we have to use on, on the farm to produce these strawberries through putting irrigation pipes under the land, through putting like, um, we put polytunnels on the field and we put plastic down to, to, to protect the, um, well, to stop the weeds from growing. Like I say, it, it, it's looking at it from the bigger picture as well, because that plastic has all got to be taken into, into, the equation, into the equation as well. So again, we're never gonna tell people what they should or shouldn't eat, but I think it's, it's looking at the facts as well and, and the importance of it really. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my point. Thanks very much, Richard. Brenda, what, what would you say to the world's minister uh, from your perspective as a young farmer? What, what advice would you give? What message? <laughs> this is quite a difficult one for me, being uh, a meat farmer as well. I mean, that's taking away my profits or my business but other than that i guess that uh i guess this forum or this platform encourages that uh, dialogue between us and the science fraternity for me i love i'm, I'm a meat lover so um I, I would rely mostly on them to come with the scientific facts to tell me that meat is not good for me um, I, I know it has some benefits like in terms of providing natural iron to a human being. And we all know the people who have gone uh, uh, completely on the plant-based diets, uh, from time to time they're encouraged to eat the meat products like your liver in terms of improving the iron uh, uh, component of uh, their diets or how yeah, they added or included to their diet. So that's a big, big question rather uh, to them where we need those kind of answers to say, can one go exclusively on meat diet? But for me, uh, it's something that only if I'm compelled to, I would go for. And so not as to sound too biased to my farming uh, enterprise as well, or in terms of what I produce, are there really facts or that could compare one to go full vegan or plant-based diet or just maybe to have a balanced diet which we all know is critical for the development of a human being so uh, i guess that's my stance and yeah thanks thanks brenda i'm also a meat lover i can understand you very well sarah those nice lumps in your country, <laughs> how do we protect them? <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, Richard alluded to some of it, but certainly from a New Zealand context, so it's not about telling people what they can and can't eat, but um, no matter what, people still need to eat and protecting food security is even recognized in the Paris Agreement. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a core cornerstone sort of to global life. And within the New Zealand context, um, there's a huge amount of land that can't grow, can't grow vegetable crops on it, um, but it can grow grass. Um, so, you know, all the hill country on my farm, you know, there's maybe, maybe 5% of our farm we could grow crops on that, you know, could be a vegetable crop or an input into a plant-based meat, but the other 95% of our farm would otherwise not be able to be in food production um, because our hills can grow grass and the rumens in cattle and sheep um, are pretty amazing things in the fact that they can take, take pasture or other, other forage crops and convert them into a source of protein, take them from something a human can't eat and convert them into a nutrient dense piece of protein that a human can eat. And so would we be better off taking all that land out of food production? And I just don't think given, given we've got a growing world population, 
um, taking taking hill country out of production because you don't think animals are good is I just don't think a sustainable answer to that problem. And then you've got the arguments about how um, animals integrated with crop production um, are really important to balance that system and you know manage the number of inputs that need to go in and um, help with your crop rotations and make sure you're managing pest disease problems. So there's there's sheep have got a role even on flatland where you could grow could grow crops. Um, animals have got a really important um, role in making that a sustainable life uh, life cycle. And then you I mean you can get into the nuts and bolts of the footprint the you know footprints of different products and in some cases um, animal products actually stack up very favorably um, to to um, to to sort of any of your vegetables and um, um, sort of alternative protein so that and that's a whole another set of arguments again thank you very much Sara that was really really um, fruitful um, I will go with the last questions to all my panelists. Uh, one minute to give a message to the science sector this time. What would you tell the science sector? What would you need as a farmer? One minute, Richard, Brenda, and then Sarah, and then I will give uh, the floor back to Deborah and GRA to close. Richard, over to you. Thank you very much. I mean, I, mean, I, I would just say that we're, we're an open door as an industry. Farmers are here to work with you. I, I think especially at our generation, we're very open to, we know change is going to happen and, and we know we need to adapt as well. And, and again, it's, it's knowing our strengths and also knowing our weaknesses and, and, and working alongside specialists as well. So yeah, d don't be afraid to, to knock on our door and, and, and come and Come and give us some guidance and some some, some support and, and sometimes we might be having difficult conversations but if we don't have those conversations how, how can we all move forward together because i think one thing that hasn't been touched on farmers a lot of the time we we, we get bashed quite a lot we, we get we get said that we're, we're actually the, the problem to have all of this but i think as the chairs um yeah it's spoken a few times we feel that we are part of the solution and, and we want to be part of that solution with with you guys thank you Thanks, Richard. I like, don't be afraid to knock at our door. Let's hope some of our scientists will listen to us. Brenda, what would you, what would you tell the scientists? How would you work with them? Um, for me, um, it's key that, uh, oh, it's rather important that uh, we both uh, find a way to work together uh, one in terms of uh, preserving the the preserving the the planet that we have uh, it's in our best interest to find ways that are working or harmonizing the ways of farming and also uh, the researchers can actually see the benefit of the farming community that are doing to do that and also other than giving them good subjects for their research, <laughs> where else would they uh, get the valuable information that farmers have? Because we are on the ground. We are giving them practical um, experiences that we have, uh, which are not like only desktop based, it's factual um, uh, and practical um, feedback or rather, um, kind of inputs into their studies as well. And also in terms of uh, the, this collaboration, which we're grateful for that uh, both the organization, the WFO and the GRA have put together. Uh, we, it's something that one is excited about as a young farmer uh, to know that we have a way where we can tap into whenever we run into difficulties where we know who to call uh, if we have challenges or if we have new or if we're trying to develop uh, new innovations within our farming practices that we know uh, we uh, or they are just a call away if i for one um, would like maybe to do a new cultivar um, i can always bounce ideas with uh, 
the GRA and just say, okay, here, is, here are my climatic conditions and what is likely, uh, or this is what I'm considering to do, or they can maybe come up to say, oh, you know, that we think uh, this is the best way to go about it. So that's how I see the two um, sectors coming together and collaborating as well which is quite exciting for me as a young farmer and also uh, making sure that we have this um, productive and constant engagement with them where we are feeding onto each other or tapping on each other's uh, strengths and making sure that um, going forward we are able to produce um, more collaborative kind of, um, uh, what's that, what could, could I call it? Um, the facts or just come up with new ways of farming which are more inclusive to both farmers and to the both, uh, to both farmers and the science fraternity, science and research fraternity as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Brenda. So from knock at our door to come on our farm and see what we are doing. Sara, the New Zealand experience, I think it's the most advanced in the world with the GRA, but uh, if you could give a message to the scientists, one minute, what would you tell them? Um, yeah, so keep, keep working with us and collaborating with us, which I think is the, it's the key message. Um, we are so reliant on um, the science, uh, you know, on the scientific community for our advances, so much of, so much of the success of New Zealand agriculture is, is down to um, science that's been done over the last 20, 30 years um, for, in terms of all the productivity improvements that have been made on farm, which have flow on benefits um, for climate change. Um, and then now as we're, as we're tackling this, um, this you know, changing world of climate change, um, we, we can't do it. We can't do it without the scientific community. Um, Farmers are incredibly innovative um, and they're very good at implementing um, thing, things on farm and we're willing to uptake, uptake new technology and stuff, but um, we, we can collaborate, but we, we, can't do it our, we can't do it on our own. And so we need, and we also need that, that ground truthing and validation to, to make sure, you know, results we might be seeing anecdotally or we might've seen something actually having that, having that tested and having some rigor applied around it so that it can be scaled up is um, is really important, and that and that collaboration is key to making sure that new developments that um, are that you know do do come up are going to be able to be practical and implemented on farm. Um, so that that just it's a real two way communication. But particularly as we enter the world of policy implementation, that that's all got to be grounded in science, and so we're relying on the scientific community to um, to help back that up and to come up come up with tools that will help us to, to mitigate into the future um, and allow us to continue. Thank you very much, Sara. So two-way collaboration and communication. With this message, I would actually uh, to thank Sara, Brenda and Richard for sharing your experience as young, as young farmers, as W4 representatives and as representatives of uh, the gymnasium program. Uh, I wish you well, and I really hope that we can meet again soon. Uh, Deborah, I give the floor back to you, and thank you very much for the opportunity of this conversation, which I have enjoyed a lot. Thank you so much. Yes, great. Thank you very much, Louisa. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the WFO joining us with this particular session, and I really, again, would like to thank our panelists, Sarah, Brenda and Richard. I'd also like to thank all of the Cliff grads participants who attended this particular session for your great questions. I know we didn't have the time to get to all of them, but um, if I might say, I'm happy to, you know, pass some of the answers on from the panelists to those additional questions we didn't get around to answering. And if the panelists are happy, I can also share their contact details with you so they can start that collaboration and communication with you. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for attending this really great session. I was really, you know, really pleasing to hear the messages that were coming out at the end, particularly with regards to making sure that we continue that collaboration between scientists and farmers, particularly important for you to think about as you're all embarking on, you know, your, the start of your career as agricultural scientists and 
how you do want to engage with farmers and make sure that we really get that sort of their evidence base is required for policy in that collaboration between farmers and scientists. So um, thank you all again for attending this session and um, I know that there are a uh, couple more sessions coming up in this webinar series but um, yeah so, so we look forward to seeing you again in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all. Bye.